you have an anencephalic child who doesn't have an upper brain, mm -hmm. someone like Jackson Buell. Yeah. Uh, people can look that up online. Uh, doctors said he'll probably die. Most anencephalic children, the upper brain uh, does not develop. So you just, the neural tube fails to close. So you just have a lower brain. Mm -hmm. And Jackson lived to be about five. Uh, now his parents claimed that he did exhibit signs of consciousness. Some other people might debate that. I don't know. But you would say that if he, if a newborn didn't, you know, never develop consciousness. I mean, I guess it's like a fetus and never developed it. The structures haven't developed yet in the brain. Okay. Uh, here's one that'd be interesting. Um, suppose we had a drug that could, uh, so take the anencephaly case. Uh, normally, if you don't grow your upper, if your upper brain, consciousness doesn't develop, it's never going to develop. Suppose we had a drug in the future that could allow an anencephalic fetus uh, to develop consciousness. But if we don't give it the drug, it'll never be conscious. Uh, does that human fetus, that human being, biological human being, would they have a right to that treatment? Um, I don't think they would have any rights yet because rights I would say are only afforded to persons. I don't think okay. fetuses are afforded any rights. So no, it would not have a right to it. No. So even if we had a newborn Correct. who could be conscious if we gave them medicine, mm -hmm. uh, they don't have any kind of right to that treatment. No. And I guess the Although again, I would fight I would fight on the optics for me because when you say newborn, we're intuition pumping a normal healthy 9-month fetus that's now delivered, but I would fight that whatever you're describing a, is a very inhuman a new a mm -hmm. new well, it is a newly born human being that has a brain injury or a lack of parts of a brain. <laughs> right. Has a has it is a newly born human being with a congenital cerebral defect. Okay. And we could give this human being medication for them to have a normal and healthy life. But you're saying this human being would have no right to it. And I guess their parents couldn't, wouldn't have a right to say this child ought to be treated any more than somebody who has a dog that's injured would have a right to similar treatment. I mean, they, I mean, the, I mean, you have a right to treat your animals, right? But well, the question of whether we as a human society will treat this infant will be as similar. In like, is there some moral compulsion on like a healthcare system to provide right. emergency services or something? Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, I would say no. Okay. So not provide, no duty to provide medical care to uh, newly born human beings who have a, a brain defect. Kind of. Although, again, I'm going to fight because when you say newly born human beings, you're intuition pumping okay. a, a, a normal, healthy. What do you mean? What do you mean by intuition? Pumping? When I say intuition pump, what I mean is it's like, would you do you think it's OK to um, a person that doesn't have a brain? And then if I say, well, I guess it's a it's not barely a person. You're like, OK, so you're, it's OK to people with brain injuries. I would fight and I would say, well, when you say people or person, the intuition is when somebody thinks of a person, they think of like a normal, healthy, functioning person. And then you're plugging in like all of the normative baggage of being somebody, which is ordinarily we would all agree is an unethical thing to do to a person. Or, so, I, mm -hmm. sure. yeah. or I could be in describing it accurately, a newly born human being, because human being is a biological category. Mm -hmm. Most people have a deep intuition that newly born human beings are persons, even though they don't. Where does that intuition come from, though? It comes from the mo a moral sense that we have, uh, the same sense we have that people are persons regardless of their skin color. No, example. I disagree. I think it probably comes from us seeing human beings that are born and the vast majority oh, no. of them being healthy, right? I, I, if it was the case that only 5% of human beings that were born, you know, come out with fully functioning brains, that intuition could be markedly different. Okay. So that's the only reason why I fight on the newborn child with a brain injury. We're talking about an exceptional, kind of like when pro, um, but like when pro-choice people argue about um, uh, like abortions to save the life of the mother and they're like, shouldn't this be legal? Pro-lifers will usually point out, well, that's an exceptional circumstance, a very rare case of abortion. Right. I would argue that whatever you're talking about would be a point zero 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 one percent. This is a very rare, I don't even know if these types of brain injuries exist when people are born, except for like the hydrocephalus. Or an, well, anencephaly is a real condition. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is a hypothetical example of we develop medicine to treat it. Sure. And that's not as far-fetched as a brain transplant or a teleporter. I mean, 150 years ago, a hip replacement would be science fiction. And now we can do that. That so, is true. But I don't know if we've made any progress in terms of like brain regrowth or transplants or... But I mean, who's to say it could happen in the future? Sure. Right. I do have a concern. Like when you say I am intuition pumping, I agree with you. People can have 
misleading examples. I'm trying to keep the language very clear here. Mm -hmm. But I would say the way you use the term makes it sound like intuition pumps are bad. That's not traditionally how the term is used. So for example, the term comes from the philosopher Daniel Dennett. Mm -hmm. So he coined the term, I think back in the 80s. He wrote a book in 2013 called Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he says this, I coined the term in the first of my public critiques of the philosopher John Searle's famous Chinese room thought experiment. Some thinkers concluded I meant the term to be disparaging or dismissive. On the contrary, I love intuition pumps. That is, some intuition pumps are excellent, some are dubious, and only a few are downright deceptive. So I agree with you, someone could create a thought experiment that's deceptive in its nature, but the fact that I'm just describing what is happening to members of the human species, I don't think that's deceptive in any way. Sure, and I partially agree. Uh, so for instance, if somebody says, why would you hit your own wife? That makes about as much sense as keying your own car. We could argue that there is a pump there that I think is like the fact that you would compare your wife to a car maybe mm -hmm. demonstrates that there's a, another issue going on. With well, the yeah, I would say that the example has a mistaken set of assumptions built sure. into it, which you can do for any thought yeah, experiment. Yeah. But I, the only reason why I'm fighting on this particular point is because oftentimes when we say a person or mm -hmm. a child, there is a feature in our mind of what a future complete person or child is. But when we say a person or child absent things that are typically essential to that person or child, mm -hmm. it feels a little... Uh, if he at the end to say, okay, so you'd be okay doing this to a person or a child. Um, I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm only marking it for the audience because I know that the way that you're phrasing it makes it sound a certain type of way and I want to fight okay. the rhetorical. Yeah, uh, here's, another, here's another question then. Mm -hmm. um, now you would agree though that infants have consciousness. Uh, so, they're, yeah. they're aware of things. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about the level of consciousness. Um, so it'd be wrong to kill them. What if a human being was injured and because of their injury, they had, um, they permanently were at the level of consciousness of a newborn? Would you say that that's still a person? I believe so. My understanding is that like once you've, once those parts in the brain are communicating and you've got some level of conscious experience, you can, it's, it's there. It's not, again, like I said, I don't believe that you go from like lizard consciousness to dog consciousness to ape consciousness to human consciousness. Like once it's there, it's there. It's got to be in that bucket of human conscious experiences, even if it might be relatively subdued. Do you think a, th a three-year-old human being is more conscious of the outside world than a newborn infant? Um, whether or not it's more or less conscious, I don't know if that's as much part of the development of the brain versus the acquisition of sense data. So if you take um, a one month old and for some reason it's like a little bit developmentally delayed in terms of like it's the brain growth, but it can still collect and accrue a whole bunch of experiences, then that level of development might be enough to gain uh, uh, a surprising understanding of the world. I mean, obviously it's gonna be cognitive impairment, but I don't know if like the three-year-old is more conscious because they have a higher level of consciousness or if they've just been spending more time collecting data about the world. Like I would say a 25-year-old is probably more conscious of the world than a 10-year-old, but I don't know if that's because like the 25-year-old developmentally or consciously um, from an experience is like more mature no, because I, they've collected more data information. I agree with you, a 25-year-old will have more conscious experiences, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the very act of perceiving the outside world, uh, I would say that a five-year-old and a 25-year-old, mm -hmm. um, it's pretty similar. Time might run a little bit slower for the five-year-old. They haven't been around as long. That's why summer break felt forever when we were kids, and mm -hmm. now it goes by fast when we're parents. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I have three kids. I've seen the infant stage all the time. They're, they're basically eating machines, pooping machines, they don't they can't even they can't recognize you just by sight would you agree that an infant and then a one-year-old their brain has to get bigger and develop more neurons and synaptic connections to have more different kinds of experiences wouldn't they mm -hmm. i don't know if i would say it's like i don't think i would call them an inhuman conscious though prior to that this is probably just like part of the development of a conscious experience but like my understanding is that even in the womb i believe um uh, children, whatever you would call it, like a third trimester developed thing can identify differences in languages, for instance. So I don't know. I think I take issue sometimes with the framing that like a one month old is like, or here's the, the, the yeah, third like a, trimester fetus hears different sounds, can, can differentiate different languages. Um, I believe that like on, on newborns, I think the city was like, I think they tested it, it was like one, three and five days, I think. But you can um, test like the, uh, I think it's, they hook something up to the head and they see the differences between the native language, a non-native language, and then gibberish. And I believe that newborn, like within a week, can already differentiate 
different sounds that are not part of the native language. So I don't think like a one day old is like just a blob that has no concept of anything. I think even in the womb, like fetuses are already starting to accrue data about the outside world. I agree with that. But do you think a dog could probably understand, like dogs can understand the content of words like sit and stay. Um, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure about that. I'm pretty agnostic on the conscious experience of animals. I feel like human conscious experience is a really sophisticated, sapient thing. I don't know if I would say that animals have anything even resembling our experience. I'm not entirely sure. I about agree. It. It's not like you or me, mm -hmm. but have you ever had a dog? Yeah, lots. Yeah. Did you ever train them with commands? Yeah. Okay. So it, it seems like, like an infant that they don't recognize like verbal commands. It'd be great if they did. Uh, or like the example I gave with, um, with pigs, mm -hmm. uh, you can, people can Google this online. Pig plays video games. Uh, you know, they have pigs, they have to move the cursor to get it onto the blue dot and they get a treat and they can do that more than just what random chance would allow. Like pigs seem pretty smart. Uh, they, I think it'd be fair to say they have more of a conscious awareness of the world than like what a newborn infant has. I don't know if that's true. Um, I think that smart is a word that we use, but I don't know if like ability to problem solve or do Pavlovian associations is the same type of thing as having a robust sapient experience that humans have. I do agree that dogs and pigs and um, dolphins especially can learn really complicated, intricate patterns, but I don't know mm -hmm. if they have the same like semantic understanding of the world or type of conscious sapient experience that humans do, even if they can do really mm -hmm. complicated pattern recognition, essentially. Yes, yeah, because this is what I'm trying to figure out here is that, so let's say someone's permanently at the newborn level, so they're very disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, do you think there's people, if that, pers that person might be on a feeding tube, because they might be really hard to manage. Mm -hmm. Imagine a 35-year-old who acts like a newborn, might have to restrain them, maybe can't spoon feed them, might put them on a feeding tube. People in that situation might be very difficult, and they're not going to have rational experiences like you or me. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of people would want to withhold food in that case? Um, possibly, but I think probably social contract and everything with the agreement that we have, we wouldn't do that to old people that need a lot of help with themselves. We don't do that to people with um, extraordinary mental disabilities, mm -hmm. so like low functioning autistic people or something. So this, is, this would probably fall in the category of protected people due to the mm -hmm. rights that we afford everybody in society. And right? so you don't have a principled objection against the social contract being widened to include unborn human beings. You just personally don't agree with it. Um, would I have a problem with it being widened? I mean, I would because I would disagree with the widening of it. I disagree with the moral justification for it, I guess, or the metaphysical justification for it. Because I don't think that, I don't think a one cell thing is the same thing as a as an adult or even a third trimester sure. fetus. It's yeah. not the, it is, yeah. I agree, it's not the same. I don't think it's the same thing in kind. It's, it is, well, it is the same biological kind. You're saying that it's moral value changes but as a moral anti-realist, you can't believe moral value exists subjectively. It's just your opinion. Yeah, but just because you're an anti-realist doesn't mean that you can't have opinions on, you just don't believe that those opinions are rooted in a moral fact, right? Right, you're entitled to your opinions, however incorrect they may be. Correct, and you're entitled <laughs> to your opinions, but only if they come but you from- can't, But you can't say they're incorrect. <clears throat> well, because you have a, I mean, but if you were to argue with a Muslim scholar, they would disagree, right? Sure. Or a Jewish, Jewish scholar. Um, or the, any other type of religion, right? So The fact that we disagree shows that there's some kind of objective truth we're all trying to, to seek out. That is a total non sequitur. There are people that disagree with whether Vegito or Gogeta would win in a fight in Dragon Ball GT, but that doesn't make them any more real. Just because two people disagree over a fictional thing doesn't necessarily mean that fictional thing might be real. I, I don't, don't hold people morally blameworthy based on the position they hold of who would win in a fight, Superman or Goku. I would I, just like to point out, I think... Don't, uh, whatever you're going to say is wrong. Well, I'm pretty sure Dragon Ball... GT is not canon. Just letting yeah, you know. Okay. That's an objective fact. Just letting you know. A, well, but if, okay. we, if we argue over whether it is or isn't canon, apparently it becomes an objective fact. Well, I so. reckon we ought to stick to uh, the abortion topic. But, I, um, but no, no, but I, I will take issue because you said that a couple times now. Just because two people disagree over something doesn't necessarily mean it's an objective fact of the matter, right? I agree, but okay. also it doesn't follow that just because people disagree that there is no objective fact. Well, the, no, I never used that, though. What I said was the inability to reconcile a disagreement means that sure. there might not be a, an objective fact because there's no sensory organ that we have to perceive moral fact. Again, to the one example, husband hits a wife, how can anybody agree or disagree whether that ought to be a way that we discipline people? For instance, you said- well, the, you, you The, said the that, situation you yeah. described is underdeveloped. I'd ask, why did he hit his wife? How exactly did he hit his wife? Uh, if he 
hit her because she's uh, gone crazy because of some kind of drug and is going to attack her she children. hits him uh, he hits her because she disrespects him in public mm-hmm. she says something like um, my husband doesn't uh, make the bed in the morning pisses me off and then he yeah. slaps her in public and I would say that that is wrong even when society once said it was right and then but then another person disagrees with you sure. how do you reconcile the disagreement well we would we would go and once again I want to get too far away from abortion here but we would go back to our basic framework for understanding morality so if you look at natural law for example or just even basic intuitions we say natural law yeah well natural law is just things have a nature they have a way that where they flourish uh we can see a a good tree versus a bad tree non-morally sure do you get worried that you run into weird naturalistic fallacies or assumptions there for instance it's natural for very young people to have sex before marriage naturalistically right sure so how does natural law how do you reconcile that with biblical law well, I'm not even bringing the Bible into this. Okay. So like when I would look at, let's say, like what our organs are for, mm-hmm. I would say, OK, well, what is sex? Uh, what does it do? Uh, yeah, it creates these pleasurable feelings, but it also involves the exchange of gametes. And that creates uh, a biological human being. And people are going to, guess, disagree when it has moral value, but allowed to continue to develop. Normally, it will develop. And it's a very needy human being. Nearly everybody agrees that when it's born. Sure this needy thing is going to die unless somebody takes care of it. I agree. But backing up, there's a lot of other manipulations of sexual organs that don't involve the creation of a child. Sure. But I don't, I don't want to uh, derail us into talking about sexual morality, though that is okay, sure. an issue when it, when it comes to abortion. I do uh-huh. think... I, I will, real quick, just because it's a little... Because I understand that you've set up a lot of questions for, I you, will say, you intuition can, pumping, um, that kind of make my position sound insane. You can but ask the, me questions too. That's fine. Well, I I mean to well but these up. are the questions that I'm more interested in because you come from a position of moral authority where you believe that you have a set of objective facts that you want to argue in favor of. But my argument to you would be, I don't believe that you can ever prove an objective fact without diving into the Bible. There's no way that we can reconcile moral fact disagreements because we don't have a sensory organ to perceive it we can argue over color we can argue over gravity we can argue over things we can perceive but morality we can't perceive we just have how we feel about it and i don't think it's a satisfying answer for a lot of people and i would just say if that were true there's really no point in us talking about this at all right now like you'd have to say it's not an objective fact like is it an objective fact that the state should allow women to have abortions is it an objective fact that the state should well that should is doing a lot of work there should and with regards to my purported morals i would say yes it is that they should be allowed to have an abortion well it's but it's not objective you're just saying i would really like it without them being objective right or no well uh, what you're saying here is that you would just like if the state did what you thought was good correct what what you agreed with what you yes correct or not even what you thought was good because that's a factual category what makes you feel good if the world were that way correct okay that's an opinion it is. Okay. That's why we argue with each other. Is to argue. But I believe at the end of the day, we're engaged in the same game. It's just, I think that you feel like you're standing on more solid ground than you actually have. I do think so. Let me, here's another question. Mm-hmm. Do you think post-abortive women who think they are murderers or women who mourn miscarriage, like it's the death of a baby, that they're deluded? Um, not necessarily. No. Mm-hmm. Do you think? I think a- that when they're, I think that when they're mourning, I think that they're mourning um, a missed opportunity rather than the thing itself, I think. But if you asked them, women who've had abortions and say, I'm a murderer or a woman who, who miscarries, mm-hmm. and says, my, my baby died, I think most of them wouldn't phrase it because some of those women may have also gone through periods of infertility. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they would say their period of infertility was different than the loss, than the death of the human being that was residing in their womb. So I guess let me put it to you this way. Do what you th- I'm saying is that I think if a woman miscarries or if she has an abortion mm-hmm. and later comes to have regrets about it, I think that the feeling she has is probably not like, oh, my God, there was that three-week fetus and I terminated it. She's probably thinking, like, I, there was a baby that could have existed. I could have delivered a baby. I would have had a child. There was a person there that's now gone. Do you think those women ever say, I, I killed my baby, not something will They probably, become- yeah. Okay. Probably say that. Do you think a woman who says, I'm a murderer because I had my period— and I expelled an egg from my body. She's like, I murdered a human being. Do, do you think she's deluded? Um, if you thought you murdered a human being because you had a period? Yeah, you, you passed a, an egg. It didn't get fertilized, and that egg died. Uh, she's pro- It's a loaded word, but I say she's probably deluded, yeah. Why is she deluded? Um, I'm not even sure what she... I mean, periods are part of normal human 
menstruation? <laughs> Are you crying every month because you're murdering? <laughs> My point is that I, I agree. But with I would also, I, I would take the same intuitive answer and I would say, does a woman cry or feel bad when she accidentally has a slightly rougher period? She doesn't even realize that she's miscarried. Mm -hmm. Because those, there's a lot of miscarriages happen early, early on when women don't even right. know they're pregnant yet. Uh, no, I agree. I am not saying that uh, because an unborn human being is a person that everyone who miscarries will react properly or react uh, with intense grief. Okay. There's lots of born people that die. We don't shed a tear for at all. There's people dying right now as we're talking mm -hmm. and, and you know, okay. But my point is that if we, if the unborn, if a human embryo prior to 20 weeks, would you agree that it has the same moral status as an ovum, an egg? Um, same, I mean, they're different things, but yeah, roughly the same, I guess, yeah, as a no moral status, yeah. Okay, so then I would say that if a woman is, we would consider her deluded or off the reservation or, hey, there's nothing to get worked up over here, it was just an ovum, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're operating with a really mistaken sense of the world, it seems like under your view, we should have that same mentality towards post-aborted women prior to 20 weeks. But I think my view better aligns with most people's intuitions that the death of a human embryo or fetus is far, far different morally than the death of an ovum. But they're not valuing that fetus, they're valuing what it would become. And again, I agree with what you're saying, but I think that you're skipping over really important steps. If I steal $10,000 from somebody, did I steal $100,000 from them? I didn't, but if I steal $10,000 from somebody when they're 20, maybe when they're 25, they're like, oh God, like if I would have invested this or 27 over seven years, I, maybe I could have had $100,000. Mm -hmm. So when they're 25, they might feel really bad. They feel like I, I should be $100,000 richer, but that doesn't change the fact that seven years earlier, I only stole $10,000, not $100,000. So if somebody loses a fetus, they might feel bad because now they're missing the child that could have been. Much the same that if somebody would have connected with the right person earlier in life, maybe they could have had a wonderful marriage, but just because they're mourning the fact that they didn't meet a person at the right time doesn't mean they're suddenly divorced. The marriage never Happened, so, the so you're saying when, when, when somebody yeah. grieves over a miscarriage at let's say you know 12 weeks that's the same grief as like misconnections on craigslist like oh he could have been the one yeah okay well, i'll leave it up to our listeners to see if that is plausible um and the last one i guess um just to make sure you're on the record of this uh do you agree with laws that would make it illegal to kill wanted fetuses like, let's say a woman's pregnant, she's really excited, her boyfriend is like, I wanted you to get that abortion, and, you know, he gives her, he slips her a drug, or he, like, kicks her in the stomach or something to kill the baby, kill, sorry, to kill the unborn human being, uh, and that human being dies, or he kills the pregnant woman, and this 12-week fetus dies along with her. Mm -hmm. In, like, 35, 38 states, and under federal law, that would be a homicide for killing that unborn human being. Do you not agree with those laws? Prior to 20 weeks, no. Okay. All righty. So, and like I said, and I'm fine to pitch back over to you. You can, I mean, you can interrogate. I have more for you, but you can interrogate me also. I want to recap your view and what it leads to. Mm -hmm. um, well, just, just to recap, it's permissible to kill infants who have not been conscious yet, uh, to kill toddlers. Oh, yeah. What if toddler loses all of his memories? And they're never, and they're not going to come back. He's at the same stage as like a 19-week fetus. Um, and and it, there, that's a, it's impossible. That's like asking me, like, are you killed when you teleport into Star Trek? I don't think I have an answer for that. I don't think that's it's a very difficult hypothetical. I think it challenges the concept of identity, but I don't know if that gets into like a human life or not a human life. If we're talking about deleting somebody's memory and resetting their brain to 19 weeks, but why does it? Because I guess. Well, I guess here is, what if I gave you this argument? Hold on, let me, I have here, because your symmetry, the symmetry argument you're making, mm -hmm. I feel like it is, um, I can make a better one that runs on the same principles. Okay. So wh what about this argument? A person stops, ex I don't endorse this for everything, but let's just do it for this, this discussion. Okay. A person stops existing when future conscious experience becomes impossible for that individual. Okay. Do you agree with that? When future conscious experience becomes impossible for that individual. Yeah, they lose the ability to have a conscious. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. So a person stops existing when future conscious experience becomes impossible for that individual. Mm -hmm. um, 
Number two, a person exists as long as future conscious experiences are probable for that individual. Well, they, and they, and they had one prior, yes. Because otherwise that, that sentence is meaningless. Then why, don't, why don't I add this writer to it then? Uh -huh. uh, and any conscious experiences they have must be psychologically connected to any previous experiences. Uh, maybe. It's just the sentence that you gave. A person exists as long as future conscious experience is possible. So you've got the future conscious experience in there. But when you say a person exists, that person, I think, begs the conscious experience. Because I don't know what it means for a person to exist if there is no conscious experience yet. I'm just trying to do the exact same symmetry argument okay. that you're doing. That if you stop existing, mm -hmm. at the, if you are an individual, mm -hmm. okay, and you stop existing when for this individual, future conscious experiences are impossible. Correct. Then why can't we say, then the other one would be, for this individual, mm -hmm. this individual is a person as long as future conscious experiences are probable yeah as long as you but you when you're making the graph and the math then you have to have the filled in circle and then the ray it it's just saying like look circle. this yeah. this person future conscious experiences mm -hmm. if they're impossible you are not a person correct so the symmetry for that and mm -hmm. in fact i'm actually being generous because the symmetry would not be improbable it'd be possible sure so it, my point would just be then a person if a person stops existing when future conscious experience becomes impossible, why can't we say a person exists as long as the future experiences are possible and a person starts existing at the first moment those experiences are possible? I think that is my position. It isn't because I would say, so for example, if somebody, uh, ends up in a persistent vegetative state, mm -hmm. uh, they've lost their immediate capacity to have conscious experiences. But some people do come out of persistent vegetative states. Okay. All right. So the point is not that they're able to have conscious experiences. It's just that at some point in the future, they will be able to do that. Okay. Okay. So then wouldn't it follow then for that individual, even when they were an embryo, they're in the same position at but some point in the future they'll have conscious experiences. I feel like your rejoinder is just gonna be the PVS person has the machinery for it, the embryo doesn't, but I just don't see how that's relevant to the symmetry here. Because the when you say the fetus will in the future, yes. it hasn't yet. There's no person yet. A person in a vegetative state or a coma, there is a person to speak of. If I have a coma right now, you can say, Stephen was a person and he might have a future conscious experience. If I haven't even existed yet, there's no Stephen to even speak of. Right, There's but, nothing there to speak but, of. Yeah. But every being with conscious experiences will have a first experience. Correct. And I think that happens at 20 to 28 weeks. Do you think a one cell organism is having an experience? No, it's not. Do you but think a I, 20 cell organism is having an experience? But I would say what makes you a person is not the moment you have the experience, but that you're the kind of being who can have those experiences. Just as someone who is brain dead is the kind of being who will never have those experiences. An what embryo is the difference is, between a, yeah, what's the difference between an embryo and a corpse? A corpse, the difference is a corpse is a human organism that has lost organic unity. Okay. The parts don't work together for the good of the whole, and so it will decompose. Okay. It will lose composition, it will fall apart. Uh, an embryo is a living organism. Its parts work together to grow other parts. When it becomes sophisticated enough, it will grow a brain to take over, to keep development going. That's but, only with the help of the mother, though, right? Well, all of us need our mom's help when we're little. We need to be fed. We need to be uh, Nothing sheltered. else past birth needs to be connected biologically to another thing, right? So whatever definition you give of the zygote, the single cell, the union, I'm gonna, I would argue you could give that same definition for a sperm or an, or an egg. You nope. can argue that a sperm or an egg on its own will never develop in anything. The sperm or the egg need an egg or a sperm. Mm -hmm. However, the fetus will never develop in anything. It needs the sustenance from the mother. Right? Right. So Here's the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that something is an organism if you can give it time, nutrition, and a proper environment, and it has the capacity to develop into a mature member of a species. And it only needs those three things, time, nutrition, proper environment. However, that's great, but that's entirely arbitrary. Why? Because that's, I could, I could, a, it's a definition of an organism. It's diff that's why sperm and egg and cancer cells, 
they are body parts. You give them time, nutrients, and environment, they'll always be that same type of thing. They cannot develop. The, it depends on how we define environment, right? Because a sperm put in the environment of an egg will eventually join and become, as it grows with a, in, inside the womb, into something like a human eventually, right? Right, but I would say that when the sperm and the egg combine, the sperm and egg no longer exist anymore. They've undergone a substantial change. They're defined as being... A subs- some- what do you think is more different? A sperm or a one-celled organism from a nine-month baby? What do you think is more different there? Wait, come again? You what is- come- yeah, there's one sperm or one egg. What's more different? The one sperm and the one egg to the zygote or the zygote to the nine-month fetus? They're diff- they are different in a myriad of ways. So, sure, but your argument, you're saying that that nine-month fetus is more in common with the single-cell zygote than a sperm or an egg has with the single-cell zygote. Nine, a nine-month fetus and zygote are the same kind of thing because the words zygote and fetus, if you look them up, would say this is the stage of development in the life of a human being. So a nine-month fetus and a zygote are very different. One's going to have billions of more cells, for example. But a sperm and egg and a zygote, the difference there is greater because we're not talking about degree. Like a zygote and a fetus, they're different in degrees, more cells, more abilities. But the sperm, egg, and the the human embryo, they're different in kind. These are organs. They're body parts. They're not a whole body. I understand what you're saying. I just, I don't know if... um I'm, I'm pushing you on the arbitrariness of your saying a difference in kind because that single cell organism is nothing in kind. It's got genes. It's got, you know, a, a genetic profile. Well, what but without the nutrients from the mom, it's, it'll grow into two, four, eight cells and then what, die? So in your world, you, the in kind of that if, single if you don't, cell. If you don't yeah. give nutrients to an infant, what will happen to them? Um, the infant could die as well. Could or will. But that conscious experience is already there, so it escapes my issue no but i'm saying that the point you're making i don't see how it shows that the embryo is not a person or doesn't have moral value just because i'm just humans saying yeah at because you're, stage are, are you have needed. a strange definition of time nutrition and proper environment um and then you are drawing an arbitrary border around i'm saying that's what makes something an organism uh, yeah but we're not arguing over something being an organism or not right we're arguing over when something gets personhood. Right? I, yeah, and I'm saying persons are kinds of organisms. Mm-hmm. A person is a kind of being capable of, of rational existence. Well, yeah. It's a kind of being capable of rational existence, but though that stops when the being is dead. Correct? Right, because it, it, the being doesn't exist anymore. It's gone back to body parts. Well, it does exist. Or what do you mean it doesn't exist? I would say that... What part stops existing? The organic unity so when you are dead so if you um when i die however you want to define that let's say well, like that's pretty total, important <laughs> it is important yeah. but just because we can't define the moment when somebody dies we know the difference between dead people and living people dead people uh their bodies start to decompose because their blood's not being pumped not being oxygenated the parts aren't working together for the good of the whole uh embry- from fertilization onward a human organism has this. My point is just that human organisms are persons because they belong to a rational kind. I really, I guess, let me put it out here. This is what I think when it comes down to the abortion debate. I think there's really only three defensible views, and yours is, and yours is not one of them. The, uh, mm-hmm. there be just to be clear on that, just real quick, because you said human organisms are part of a rational kind. I agree with you. Yes. We're just fighting over if the brackets extend to the... 20 weeks to zero weeks, basically. Like, right. I do agree with that statement, but the statement is begging the question of saying, what is a human organism. I am saying right? yeah. you don't need the immediate capacity. Mm-hmm. You don't need the immediate capacity to be conscious, to be a person, because I think you're still a person uh, even if you have a brain injury and you've lost that ability temporarily. Uh, I believe, and just what the examples that I gave earlier, I think that most people would say it is wrong to take a healthy fetus permanently make them unconscious and do God knows what with them. And the only, I think the only thing that can explain why that's wrong is because that human fetus has a right to properly develop in virtue of being a person. And I think it's a very strong moral intuition most people would share. Sure, do you think that if, um, do you think if it was the case that a fetus were to grow um, 8, 16, 32 to 64 cells in size and then it had some kind of um, deformation or it wasn't able to develop past that point, do you think we have a moral obligation to deliver the 64-cell organism and then keep it alive in a dish for as long as we can, assuming we could deliver it? 
I think we have a moral obligation to provide medical care to sick humans. Yeah. Okay. So that's why so, I gave the example, like we provide um, spina bifida treatments. Even I think we could do it possibly before the 20 week cutoff. Mm -hmm. Like we could start having medical technology for uh, fetuses before 20 weeks. Sure. And I'm, okay. not, I'm not to be clear. I'm not talking about yeah. any of that. I just to be very, very, very yeah. clear. What I'm saying is a woman is having trouble. Maybe the pregnancy is not going okay, yeah. but we have the ability to keep any organism alive in a Petri dish for as long as we want. You would say there's a moral obligation to safely deliver using a microscope and tweezers or whatever, a 64 cell organism and put it in a Petri dish and then provide nutrients and keep that thing alive until the end of its natural I, I, metabolic function. No, I think function. that you should provide proportionate medical care. So for example, when my, my wife and I were dealing with miscarriage, like our child almost miscarried, we, we rushed to get progesterone to inject her with it. it. It's thick as concrete, it's rough to administer. But we were doing that to save the life of that actual child who might have been only a few cells, more than 64, because most people figure it out, it's a lot older than that. Um, Actually, I have an interesting question. Wait, about, wait, wait, no, 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 wait, wait. We can, go you ahead. can ask the question, write it down, you, you, but because you used a word here to escape that. Wait, on the book, can you show me what the one week thing looks like? Yeah, sure. Or what's the one earliest week? picture? The earliest or, picture. Yeah, is. sure, I've got mm -hmm. that right here. Um, here, yeah. This would be this guy. So I'm asking if you have to deliver that. So this would be a notice. Yeah, this is, says a new human being. Yep. Right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we had the technology to deliver that, and the care was quite simple. You just water the dish and maybe put a couple of nutrients in the dish, and you could keep that alive for five to 10 years. You'd be just as morally obligated to keep that alive in a Petri dish than you would for a child that might be born a, a little bit unhealthy, keeping that alive. I don't know if we're morally obligated to sustain the life of a human being by putting them essentially in a freezer. It's not uh, a freezer. It'd be a Petri dish. You could play music for it if you want. Probably wouldn't do very much good at that stage, but... The, the music, I would sure, say. Sure, but, um, but mm -hmm. your position, because now right. you're, well, cause you're relying on human intuition but, a no, lot, you're, you're trying to say that like it's so obvious that there's a life, but now when I've challenged you to putting that thing in a Petri dish and watering it, if I were to ask you the same question about, let's say a child is born and it's only gonna live to be six months to one year old, right. I'm a parent, you're a parent, both yeah. of us would probably say, yeah, do everything you can for it. You can't just kill it, even if right. it's gonna die at an early age. Right. But now I'm asking you for the 64 cell organism, we have the same obligation well, what for if, that in a Petri yeah, dish. Yeah, but you could have all these examples where we don't know what to do. What if they said, you know, hey, Destiny, for your child, we don't know if we can save them, but if you put them in this cryo tank mm -hmm. in 200 years, we think they'll come up with a cure. I agree. It would be hard, but that's why to quote you earlier, it's just a hypothetical. So earlier you asked me about a child born missing parts of its brain that we could inject a drug to give it more of a brain in the future. That's a pretty crazy hypothetical. So now I'm asking you an equally crazy hypothetical. A 64 cell organism is born. Do we have an obligation to keep no. it alive in a Petri dish? Indefinitely. Because some hypotheticals are going to be closer to reality than others. Uh, Brain transplants and swaps are pretty far away. Cryogenetics is closer, but still not quite there. Uh, and the, like the example I gave is just, is it wrong to take a healthy fetus and cause them to be permanently unconscious? That's pretty, we, I mean, we lobotomize born people. It's not that far out of the realm. Lobotomies do not mean a loss of consciousness. When you say healthy fetus, it implies healthy functioning brain function. So right. again, I'm we're using I'm, a lot of but words. But if it's before 20 weeks, there's no person there, you could destroy the brain, the developing brain. Correct. There's no problem. Yeah, but in your world, if a 64 cell thing was born, it needs to be kept alive in a Petri dish until natural metabolic function cease. No, we should provide medical care for human beings prior to birth. We might disagree sure. about what kind of care that is. Let's take, for example, though, fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay. Now, under your view, here's what I'm, I'm curious about. Um, you've given the analogy before that drinking while pregnant, uh, that doesn't harm an individual. It harms a person in the future. Mm -hmm. Like if you hang a piano and it's got withering wires and it's going to fall on Bob in three days. Yeah. It's bad because it's, you know, it's going to fall on him in three days. Mm -hmm. And I guess the analogy there is like when the child's born, eventually they're going to figure out why am I not like the other kids? You know, that they're going to figure, you know, the harm is later, I guess, than instead of when you were drinking before. Correct. Okay. Uh, is a woman, let's say a woman's diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome and the, the, this human being has. Wait, you know, can you clarify? Like, sorry. Oh, the woman. Yeah. The, the, not the woman, the, 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 the child, the yeah. human fetus has fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is she morally obligated to abort that fetus and start over? Um, is the fetus past 20 weeks? No. Um, is she morally obligated to abort a pre 20 week fetus? Knowing if she does nothing, a human being under your view with fetal alcohol syndrome will come into existence. I'm, I would lean towards 
No. Why? But it would be close because I don't know under what circumstances would you be morally obligated to terminate a pre... Um, I don't think that's a level of harm that justifies it. Like, for instance, if a child was to be born with any number, maybe it could have uh, Huntington's disease or Tay-Sachs or anything else, would we morally obligate people to abort or Down syndrome or any kind of... I don't know if you could morally obligate people to abort those things. I think that's... I think that gets into a weird... Uh, Eugenics th- territory that do I don't you know think it's wrong, but do you mm-hmm. think it's wrong for someone to um, is it wrong for someone to drink to excess because they don't care if the fetus gets fetal alcohol syndrome yes then what's the difference if that's wrong why wouldn't it be wrong to refuse to abort that child human being I mean you can do future harm to something and it's wrong but that doesn't necessarily mean that that thing uh, has to be terminated like I think these two things are disconnected Right, but I'm saying that in both cases, the end result is the same. You do something, and it causes a being with a disability to come into existence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're saying, well, yeah, it's it's wrong to drink. Well, I guess we say here, is it wrong to cause a fetus to have fetal alcohol syndrome if you're planning to get an abortion at 12 weeks anyways? No. Okay. So it's, it sounds like there... That would be to make through the piano analogy. Is it wrong to put a piano in a building for it to fall over in three days if you don't think a person is going to be underneath the building? No. Well, let me give you to the piano analogy. Suppose you have the piano. The only way to keep it from hitting Bob Mm -hmm. is to cut the wire early so it drops on Bob's shopping cart. Yeah. Bob's a homeless man, pushes shopping cart around. Mm -hmm. So it's either going to destroy, because that's more like pregnancy then. The piano is either going to destroy, harm Bob the person or harm the non-person, the shopping cart. Mm -hmm. It seems like you only have two choices there. Would you say there, you're obligated to destroy the shopping cart? Um, Where does the obligation to destroy the shopping cart come from? I don't understand that part. Bob is pushing, (laughs) Mm -hmm. he's pushing his shopping cart. And you hung that. Well, no, here, well, here we can even without the analogy, okay? Because I'm following you on the fetal alcohol syndrome thing. We can agree that it's wrong for. I think we both agree it would be wrong to cause harm to a future person by drinking alcohol while you're pregnant. But we let's both say the, that, right? the only alternative. Mm-hmm. I'm using the piano example. Yeah. We, I want to still. We can still keep with it. Okay. Um, if in the piano, because you seem pretty clear here. If in the piano example, we only have two choices: we do nothing, and it injures Bob, mm-hmm. or we do something and it destroys Bob's shopping cart. Mm -hmm. You seem pretty confident we should injure the non-person. Correct. And yet you don't feel that way where a woman who has fetal alcohol syndrome, she has two choices. She does nothing, baby is born, has FAS, or you do something and the pre-viable fetus is destroyed. Yeah, okay, maybe we're off. The the part of your analogy that's, um, or the, the part of the hypothetical game that's challenging is to force her to do something. So let's say it was the case that a woman was drinking and yeah. then she gets a pregnancy and it's like, oh shit, I'm pregnant yeah. and I'm 16 weeks pregnant. Yes. And she's like, I'm gonna have an abortion because I don't wanna harm a future person. Right. I think that's totally fine. The question is you originally posted was, which should we obligate her to have an abortion at 16 weeks? That gets a lot harder, yeah. I think. Should, but we the, o- should we obligate destroying the cart <laughs> instead of hurting Bob? That's the thing, though. It's destroying the cart versus hurting Bob. Like, fetal alcohol syndrome is often not, like, lethal. It's not like the life is completely... Let's say it's a, mm-hmm. it's a light piano that's going to cause <laughs> damage. Uh-huh. It's still going to... It's going to make Bob messed up for a while when it hits him in the head. I don't know if you can obligate... Because at that point, then, shouldn't you obligate the termination of any fetus that might have certain types of conditions? You're, I'm using mm-hmm. the word eugenics and... Well, not under... Basically, and but. once again, I'm trying to tease out mm-hmm. your view. Because under your view, it is impossible to harm... A fetus prior to 20 weeks it is but there is a harm to the mother and to the autonomy of the mother if you force her to have an abortion like there is a harm in losing a future person much the same that if i steal ten thousand dollars from somebody in 30 years it might have been a hundred thousand dollars the difference is when i take that ten thousand dollars i'm not taking a hundred thousand dollars much the same that i could deprive somebody of a future person and they could actually experience a deprivation of the future person but killing somebody's 16 week fetus is not the same as killing their two-year-old two years later mm-hmm. that's the difference Right. But I would say that we force people like parents all the time to do or not do certain things so that their children don't come to harm. Uh, you know, we, we restrict mm-hmm. uh, even, even things like secondhand smoke, for example, mm-hmm. in really restricted situations with a child. Mm-hmm. I think parents get obligated all the time. But Sure. But we would never say that like a child exposed to heavy secondhand smoke, mm-hmm. should we kill him before he has lung cancer or something, right? We right. would never make that. Now, my view, of course, is that anybody with a disease or a, or a genetic defect or a condition we should help that person, we shouldn't kill them, regardless of their stage of development. Okay. All right. Oh, 